from LPI Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. It's R and R on sports with Uncle Howard, Howard Robertson. His legacy is terrible with regard to the NBA. Jennifer Conroy, Anna Kornikova. She's terrible, but how much in endorsements did she have up until Serena? Now and the magnificent Larry Robinson. Coaching changes. I mean, Scott Skiles just broke out and said, "I'm out." It's R and R on sports. Hello and welcome to a little R and R on sports. I'm Howard Robertson, and I'm Jennifer Conroy, and I am the fantastic, the amazing, the freshest in the America. Ain't baby. nobody fresh. Larry Robertson in the house. <laughs> I'm just wow. so fresh and clean. Why are you? Why I you wish they could have seen you grab yourself when you said the oh, freshest, yeah. the freshest in the America. That was kind of freaky. America. That was kind. I wasn't squeezing my, you know, I wasn't squeezing my nipples or nothing. Okay, okay. I think, okay. I think he's a little okay. lonely behind that glass. Uh, yeah, I am lonely behind the glass. See now, oh. now, now, don't, don't entertain. See, please I don't entertain lonely. him. So how you doing? Y'all, I'm we good, ought to do the show. How y'all doing? Y'all, we ought to do the show on this side of the glass. No. No. We ain't coming over We there. need to get a real engineer. That's really <laughs> what we need. We need a real engineer. Oh, ain't nobody. Because you, you got been no perpetrating, problems. man. You ain't got no problems with all our interviews. We sounding fresh. Even our real producer be sitting up like, And yeah. for those of you who don't know, uh, he's kind of double dipping. Larry's kind of double dipping between co-hosts and uh, engineer yep. some days. Yeah. Well, uh, that's because I'm multifaceted. He thinks he knows his way around I'm the board. I'm multifaceted. Uh, uh-huh. I'm ambidextrous. Yeah. That's what she said. I, look here, I thought you were Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm multilingual. Okay. All right. Uh, oh. What's going on? What's oh. going on? Sports the places wise. I could go. <laughs> Dr. Sue <Seuss> said no. <laughs> That's for the podcast, Jen. Oh, That's no. for the podcast. So in sports, we've got some interesting things going on. Lots of stuff oh, going yeah. on. Well, you know, you got to start at basketball. You got to, you know. Training camp has started. Training camp has started. I want to know the, the how it's going over The richest training Golden camp State. in the history of the NBA. When you can give Giannis Antetokounmpo, how the heck you pronounce his name, <laughs> you give him $100 million dollars for four years. Then you turn around and give C.J. McCollum a hundred something for four years. Wait a minute. Then you give. Yes. Then you give. Then you give Mike Conley a hundred hundred fifty five million dollar man. But our boy Mike Conley got taken out at the uh, at the head of the Heat by LeBron. Yeah. What you mean? Come hey, on, but you but gotta LeBron expect LeBron to get that money. He's Who knew? Who the thunk? <laughs> you know he's the same. You know, I here's one for you. At least Who has Conley the highest didn't teams. payroll in the NBA this coming year? Warriors. Gotta be. Who you got? I got the Warriors. Portland Trailblazers. What? Really? Portland Trailblazers. Really? Yeah. yeah absolutely. They well, got you the know, Zach Randolph payroll. is still getting paid by the Trailblazers, so that would be part you of the know, A lot of these guys are really smart. They're deferring large portions of their salary till later in their career. So Zach is still getting uh, Zach is still getting similar, about 20 very million. Si- very similar to uh, Bobby okay. Bonilla. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how he yeah. deferred oh, all. Wasn't that a sweet deal? Man, that was Isn't amazing. Isn't that a sweet deal, deal right? Amazing to get deal. paid in perpetuity. Dak Prescott doing his thing. I am Dak. not a I am still not a Cowboys fan I'm not, per but I'm se. A Dak I am fan. a Prescott fan. I'm, I'm a, a Dak, Dak fan. Prescott I'm a Dak fan. fan. I'd like their uh, management to shut up. Dallas? Mhm. For the beginning of the season, I mean JJ Watt already out. Uh-huh. I mean, Adrian Peterson, Adrian Peterson Romo, yeah. Terry Bridgewater, and I mean, I'm sure there's many more, but those are the few that just came to mind, but I mean, it seems like all some... of those make it, uh, Tony Romo, all yeah, of Tony those Romo. make it so hard to uh, to come back. So, yeah. I mean, so hard and We've already got teams out of from, contention now. Yes, yes, as a result of that. And uh, so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that when we come back. We're going to talk more um, NCAA football and we're going to talk some NFL football and we're going to talk about Michael Rose Ivy and we have a fantastic fantastic second uh, segment with um, Tommy Smith the great Tommy Smith so don't go anywhere we've got uh, an opportunity for you to LMAO Ah. and uh, it's kind of deep this week (laughs) 
Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this special call meeting of the WSSWP. What sports should we play now? This meeting is necessary because since the Olympics, our traditional go-to sports have been ripped from our very hands by other people. That's, That's right. right. Tell big it like brother, it is, big brother. brother. Tell it like it is. We need to make sports great again. Although the U.S. won medals in the Olympics, we were grossly underrepresented, and that's not fair. Right on, brother. Preach. Preach. Tell, Tell it, it like it, it is. is. It is. Gymnastics. Swimming, shot putting, the marathon, the steeplechase. Don't forget sword fighting. It's called fencing. Oh, mercy, they putting up fencing too. It wasn't the Olympics. It was more like the Soul Olympics, if you know what I mean. We are being diabolically, systematically, institutionally targeted and eliminated based on our condition of 3M. Massively misplaced melanin. <gasps> I'll prove it to you. The people that run the fastest in the Olympics and everywhere else. What do they have in common? Spade. No, melanin. Oh. And the people that jump the highest in the NBA and everywhere else. What do they have in common? Leaping ability. Wrong. Melanin. You see, melanin is that special secret sauce for sports success that we do not have. So, as is our tradition, when we can't win the game, we do what? Change the game! That's right. So the floor is now open for nominations for which sport we should play now where melanin is a non-factor. How about NASCAR? That's great! Ethel, are you writing this stuff down? Oh, honey, how do you spell nasty car? I recommend a new sport called Backside Slip and Slide. Backside Slip and Slide? You're familiar with the game Slip and Slide, of course. But when required to slide on one's backside, the winner will inevitably be one a flat, not fat, gluteus maximus. A glutey what? That means buttocks, Ethel. Backside, slip and slide. I think that's that gum brilliant. Slip and slide. Backside, slip and slide will become America's new pastime. What's it called again? Backside, slip and slide. Backside, slip and slide. I love it. I love it. Other people can't play that because they get dragged. Yeah, they do. That Re- That's Serena Williams. She can't play that game. No, she can't. She not. can't play that game, Chairman. Hey, this is Dr. J. Hi, this is Freaka Ketchum. This is John Hollinger, Vice President of Basketball Operations for the Memphis Grizzlies. Tim Brown, NFL Hall of Fame and Tuck T. You are listening to R&R on Sports. And we are back with R and R on Sports. Exciting weekend. Yes, Every scary. football weekend is exciting weekend to me, though. I mean, this is this is when it, uh, the weather. Hey, how you like the weather? Ah, you know, I'm the weather cold. broke. Is it fallish? It see, it seems like it's broke. It's finally it's it's feeling a little chilly outside. Yeah, yeah. It Especially feels in the good. morning. Well, it's I, seasonal. I LMAO'd my. Uh, AO off, so I'm, I'm chilly. I need a sweater. It's chilly. I mean, no, it's chilly. It's, I'm going to have to put on my white girl it's uniform. It's seasonal. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's talk about, so you can't get more seasonal than college football. Um, Michael Rose Ivy. Michael Rose Ivy, but wait a minute. Let's let's talk about the top five first, the good stuff first. The, the undefeated, Alabama, Ohio State, Louisville, Michigan and Clemson. Well, one of them are going to be defeated this weekend. Yeah, with Louisville yeah. and Clemson. Louisville and playing. Clemson. So, what's, so you th- what's your thoughts on that game? I think that Louisville is much too dynamic for them. I know that Clemson has some a, a, a very nice defensive secondary. They're going to be put to good use. Oh yeah, this weekend. And, I think um, it's. I think weather will come into play playing in Death Valley, going from Louisville, the same as if you go into Denver. They're going to Alabama. 
Oh, they are going to Alabama. <laughs> Who's going to Alabama? I mean, not Alabama. South, South Carolina. Carolina. South yeah, Carolina. South Carolina. But Where no, did I but get Death Valley yeah, from in my brain. Well, that's what they call the stadium. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, my thing with 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 any of this is that is that Louisville has not played a night game. So they had one primetime game with Florida State, which they were at home. It was the whole pageantry around Muhammad Ali mm-hmm. and the float like a butterfly symbol that now is associated with Louisville football and Louisville sports. I don't think um, I knew that. And and beyond that, beyond that, well, you know, they had uh, they had uh, his daughter on on the uh, pregame show. Okay, but nevertheless, beyond that, I want to see how Louisville plays in primetime. Uh, it's eight o'clock at night. Uh, and then it's going to be at home of Clemson. At, you think that's going to make a big difference in their game, though? Well, I mean, I mean, it, I mean on. this is home field advantage. I, I think Clemson is a perennial, you know, perennial team. Dabo Sweeney does a phenomenal job down there with those guys. Yeah, and I think they're going it, it's it's to. It's one game. of those games it's be where a very, very Louisville good has got to step up and step up in someone else's home field. It's going to be a very, very good game. I only hope that. Um, there's no evidence. I don't want to see. I'm concerned about the level of, of of meanness that I'm seeing. I got really concerned after we watch. We all watched the uh, Michael Rose Ivy uh, Nebraska player interview. Man, wasn't that heart wrenching? Uh, if you listen, America, if you haven't listened to the Michael Rose Ivy interview, that's on video, it's on YouTube and everything. The kid plays for Nebraska. Uh, if it doesn't pull at your heartstrings a little bit. You might need to check yourself. You might be part of the problem, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, because you're definitely because I mean, he and some of his teammates you really took are a, deaf. You, you he and a, some of his teammates took a, a knee, but, yeah. and it is about. He had a press conference basically about um, the, the reaction the that has come from fans, cowards via social media, and um, you know, and including they, death threats. Including I mean, uh, kids, all kind of man. racial these epithets. Are kids. It, it, these, it's, are kids. these are kids. I think he man. articulated it beautifully and put it in frames of references that are undeniable in regards to quoting Dr. King. And he's also referencing issues and reactions from fans before the protest. So it's not like the protest is the only thing that spawned it. It's the things that happened before that make the protest necessary. And now people feel like they can have an open field day on black athletes that are taking a knee and taking a stand for these things. And and, and you're only showing the reason why this protest is necessary. Well, and somebody said, if you are reacting to the protest, versus the cause of the protest, then you are indeed part of the problem. you got a huge problem. If your reaction would be different if one of these athletes was a police brutality brutality fatality differently than you are from the protest, you're part of the problem. Absolutely. I would would have to agree. And and I believe that what you're seeing uh, across the board are these athletes. But the part that's gotten me more than anything is the fact that we aren't seeing a lot of these teams in unison. We are not seeing any white athletes in support at all. We've had one letter writer. Now we have Dirk Nowitzki. We've got women. There have been, to my knowledge, no white athlete professionally or unprofessionally. Let me ask you, as as a Caucasian woman, what does that say to you? Because it, what, what it says to me as an African-American male is that we are really far apart as a, as a society. I mean, it we sa- really are. It says to me that African-American males and Caucasian males are really far apart. But the first person that we saw take a knee was a Caucasian woman. And there's a lot of history between black men and Caucasian women. And some of it's really ugly and some of it's really beautiful. But for me, I'd take that knee. I think I think it says to me that it's not my fight. I think I think that's what they that's what they and are that's saying. disgraceful. That's what they are saying. It's look, that's that's your problem. That's not our issue. That's your issue, and we don't choose to weigh in on it. Now, I don't care if, I don't care how they really feel about it. Some of them could be in support but are intimidated 
Uh, but you know, it's interesting coming, then, by then, expressing then that of, support in any kind of protest situation. But then you got a lot of these guys that have stood up that supposedly are not gay, are not bisexual, or any of the others, but they stand up in support of the LGBT causes. Mm-hmm. So you know, more socially acceptable now. Well, than, it's because it's a than white people African thing. Amir- because I mean, they don't they don't get breast cancer either, but they they are wearing pink the pink everything. stuff. It's more socially acceptable. I don't think for a lot of people, uh, particularly Caucasian people, they, I don't think they believe that this is something and that is worthy part of, the of their expression of protest. Uh, or wow. uh, like I people said, people being killed is. Uh, I can't. Justly. I'm not trying to justify, Larry. I'm just no, telling I'm just you. The, I mean, I'm just yeah. telling you but the they reality. Certainly, they certainly, analysts and players alike, certainly feel free to talk about how they disagree with it, uh, the the process, the protest, the all of it. And if you, uh, there's no, there's no balance, and that is disgraceful and there's this, disappointing. There's this meanness and this lack of humanity that 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 kills me. That I mean, you know, it is. This is demonstrated. See, like social media has like make just turned up this 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 meanness on a on a level that's just that's because they're cowards. They can do it relatively anonymously. And I mean, they it's think like they it's can like do it it's anonymously. It's turned the whole animus, angry, nasty, vitriol. It's, it's out there. It's, it's, it it's seems a, like it's just on a it's whole a other level. It's a spirit that is on a whole nother level that that is unusual and one that makes this kind of a scary situation. It makes it me seems, sad. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's very, very sad. It's the same kind of spirit that would allow one human being after shooting another human being to let him just it's the, lay there and not render any kind of medical it's assistance. It's the spirit that makes um, that human him being die. Watch him shoot die. that human yeah. being. And watch him die. So, I mean, you know, we got a lot of work to do. It's a, a, There are a lot of issues. And um, we have a tremendous uh, guest on our conversation. The second half of the uh, Tommy Smith interview. This is some great stuff, y'all. Don't go anywhere. Get back with us on the other side of this Tommy Smith. Say the black of the bed. The sweet of the juice, I say the dark of the flesh and the deep of the roots. I give a holler to my sister's own welfare. Two pop kids, if don't nobody else care. And uh, I know they like to beat you down a lot when you come around. Rolling down the street with my radio on, listen to funky politics. The mayor of the city of Memphis, Mayor Jim Strickland. How are you, sir? Fantastic. We keep it real, we keep it right, and we keep it funky. Four o'clock, WDIA. Funky politics. Part of the Katsukia Network. It don't matter if the black Sure you're white. I'm not so sure. I can't verify. I seem to be reflecting the light. You seem to be absorbing it. And together we have Jungle Fever on the Blue Ball Sports Show. Powered by the Kazookian Network. This is Tommy Smith, and you're listening to R&R on Sports. Welcome back to R and R on Sports, Tommy Smith. We are happy to have you back and uh, and to pick up where we left off. Great. We talked about the protest on the stand and the aftermath seemed to be swift and sure. Beginning with uh, who at that time was the king of the IOC, the Olympics, a cat named Avery Brundage, uh, <laughs> who also was the king of the Olympics in 1936 uh, when the Nazis gave their salute, which he seemed to not have a problem with at all, uh, but he did have a big problem with what you and John Carlos did in 68. Talk about that. Yeah, well, when, race, when racism is rampant in one's mind, you know, they have a, certainly a blockbuster side uh, on the, uh, what they believe in. And that particular 1968 uh, uh, Olympic Games held in Germany, and Avery Brundage at, at that time was the president of the USOC, okay. uh, at, at which he uh, uh, was a, uh, a backer of the SS, uh, which was, was Hitler's uh, uh, personal uh, his goon, uh, his, goon swa- his goon squad. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But also, Britton Musburger made a statement uh, that he, he he called John Carlos and Tommy Smith black-skinned stormtroopers, yep. uh, which meant which meant. Uh, 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 not he but uh, he wasn't talking we were about communists, communists, because because Hitler's goon squad, as you call it, were uh, stormtroopers. Right. Yes. Okay. 
okay? So because we were black, I suppose, and they were blonde-haired, blue-eyed, well, most of them were, uh, we were, Britain Musburger called us black skin stormtroopers, which called us black communists. Mm. So basically, a Jewish man is calling two African-American athletes Hitler's <laughs> linchpins. A, 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 a CBS Sports uh, yes. uh, 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 announced. You know, it's Jewish interesting man. that we yes. we've never talked about this. You know, Brent Musburger is lauded as one of the great sportscasters. Well, he's he's still on. He, he's, yes. he's still, still moving still in that realm. Yeah. Right. yeah, yes. His other quote was, "One gets tired of having the United States run down by athletes who are enjoying themselves at the expense of their country." When you hear those kinds of comments coming from a guy. That's still on the air because literally, if that was a black man making that comment about a Caucasian man, I guarantee you he wouldn't be on on the air still. Especially in those days, you're right. Especially in those days, that's Jackie Robinson or Hank Aaron or those or those people. Yeah, he was doing because he was a power source. I mean, this man was on radio, he was on television. He could do what he thought he could, and he's kind of proving the point now because he's still out there. Although he did make an apology. Uh, some place down the line, although I didn't get one, but I heard that he did make an apology for what he said meant that he was wrong. People were upset. They were exploding on the inside. Their brains were popping open because here's two young black athletes doing something not against the law, but against the racist policies of a government that's supposed to represent all and the human rights issue, which uh, because you're born a human, that you have those human rights. The fist uh, symbolized the social part of it, the ethnic part of it, dealing with uh, 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 a, a particular area, which was civil rights. So this, 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 this move of the 60s went deeper in the system that, than just two athletes throwing a black fist up, showing black power. Did Brundage, it was further than black power. Did Brundage try to strip you guys of your medals? Well, he sure did. <laughs> in fact, there was a call to the hotel where we were staying because we had moved out of, of the Olympic Village before we were kicked out. So we were at a hotel, and we received a call in the hotel that the Olympic Committee, uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, wanted to talk to us. Will we come down to the Olympic Committee and bring our medals? No. Well, you know that was not good. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Could you see Thomas Smith and John Carlos walking with our medals in our hand to give them back? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you could have outrun all of them, though. <laughs> no, not only outrun them, but uh, technically... Uh, I'll politicize them because there was nothing done wrong in, yeah. in, in right. that move. Well, and this is also 1968, where you're only three years removed from 1965, where African Americans fought and won the right to vote. Oh, gosh, you're going back to 65 to 63, where the passage of freedom was supposed to have come, but a lot of states didn't ratify it until 10 years later. A whole lot of things had happened. If you, if you research the history books, you'll find out that the 1968 Olympic victory stand brought a lot of things to bear if you were educational enough or had enough brains to go back and, and find out what the uh, Olympic project for, 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 for human rights meant or what that idea meant as far as human rights and for civil rights. There's a whole lot of history. And also the dealing with the uh, uh, pledge of, not pledge of, at least that's a whole other thing, the, uh, the national anthem. And in, in the third segment of the National Anthem, it viewed the racist tendencies of black mm -hmm. people dying yes. and, mm -hmm. and that the cause were, mm -hmm. uh, were, 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 were deemed, were looked at as necessary for the system to move on if the black folks kept dying. Great segue. This is R&R this is on, on Sports, and we're speaking with black power Olympian Tommy Smith from the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. Uh, Tommy, tell me how you feel about the things that are happening today? As long as there's man and a system like ours, uh, a, de a democratic system, it's going to be changed. It's going to be changed, made, and it's going to be changed, not made. And those that which are made, people are going to fight against them because status quo seems to be the only thing uh, most people understand. Leave it like it is, it will get better. It's not going to get better until somebody uh, sacrifices uh, in their moving to make that change. And I think the athletes nowadays uh, has, has grown to understand that the responsibility is not making millions. The responsibility is to make a stand. Uh, I had no money in 1968. Well, you can still say that today. The athletes today are making a, a stand, making a change. They have their money or they have their stances, they have their creativities in whatever sport they're in, and they're sacrificing that to make a change. I don't think these guys are militants. They're just making a stand against a system that needs 
changing. And it's how they stand or how they not don't, don't stand is, is, is what people are insulted about, especially the, the veterans who some understand, some don't. I can understand this, but that's no reason for Thomas Smith to say, don't do this because I sacrificed. But they should know that they are making a sacrifice, and for the sacrifice is to, to make a change, they must stick to what they are doing and, and then move to fruition on this and knowing what they are doing before they do it. The proactivity of what they're doing is exciting to more than it is detrimental to others. How do we make this a human rights issue? Well, you know, I wish I could give you a, 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 a simple description. It's a, a, but what Tommy Smith will say is uh, that they're human, uh, and their understanding of their needs to continue to survive is to understand that they must they must uh, move with proactivity regardless of color uh, and, and, and make a change uh, for all people and not just the status quo of what is uh, uh, the movement of today. Yes, I can understand why they're upset because maybe they don't have a platform to stand on because they've been standing on this, uh, this uh, 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 status quo for so long they kind of forget that democratic processes is to move out the rotten and bring in new seed. And this is what's happening now with the movement of the young athletes. Those of us who are in our <laughs> almost twilight years, guys, don't say nothing when I say twilight <laughs> years. I know you need it, but talking about Tommy Smith now, knowing that the change is there. But one of my favorite songs is uh, 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 The Change, the change Gonna, gonna come. come. You know, you, know, you all know who that's by. Right. It, but but it, 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 and it's going on. It's just moving. Share with us how you watch sports now and what's, what things are saying to you, how you, you know, assess I what's a, happening. I watch it as, as much as I can with an open mind of what people are doing, what people are saying, and how they react to what is being, what is being done and what is being said. And they're going to have different emotions about it all. So I, I try to listen to it uh, from an educational standpoint and not from a, a lopsided situation of they're wrong or they're right. I try to mix it in and make some idea of what, the, what it, 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 anyone is saying when they make a change that has not been done for, at all or in years. My first, my first year with Cincinnati, uh, I received death threats. Uh, I received hate mail, uh, came to the, uh, the, uh, the practice field. <laughs> so I, I know the, uh, what, uh, what Colin is going through, what he will go through for most of his life and some of the other guys who are also doing this, but the program is, Im- is important enough to them for them to make a stand. And I think each person uh, sh- should realize that, that, that whenever or whatever they do, they have to be able to, to uh, uh, reflect the reason why they are doing it, each individual, mm-hmm. not just because they're following Colin. You know, Colin started, and now it's for somebody else to have their own idea of doing it. When I got that hate mail from Cincinnati, uh, uh, and I was in my dorm, and the letter came, and I opened it up, and it really hurt me to realize that this is, this is uh, gosh, uh, long after mm-hmm. Mexico. In fact, only four years, but to me that's a long time, uh, my first year with, with Cincinnati. And I took it to the coaching staff. And, of course, my, head, the, the, my area coach was Bill Walsh, uh, the great. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and the head coach was uh, the great uh, Paul Brown, okay. who You're coached right, right. Jim Brown. So when, when I sat with them and talked, they looked at me as if, you're supposed to cry. And I said, no, I'm hurt, but I'm not destroyed. Uh, I want to show this to you, give you an idea of what I've been going through all these years. Now here I'm in Cincinnati trying to catch a ball for some money because you know, everybody dropped me when I raised the fist in Mexico City, came back, no job, uh, couldn't find uh, anything to do in terms of making it with my wife and my young, young son. So I know the feeling. I wanted to show you this to, to let you know that I still want to play, but this is on my mind. And Bill looked at it and he said, uh, I understand. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it. This is on our own sports. Tommy, when we talk about Muhammad Ali, what is it that you think and what comes to mind? This man was a quiet storm uh, that covered all pro actions that any man could do. Uh, they say he, he uh, floated like a butterfly, he sting, stung like a bee. The man was silent but heard. The man was heard in his silence. And his demise is going to be crippling to everyone who don't believe or understand that a change is needed. With that, we are going to thank you, Tommy Smith, for being with us here on R&R on Sports. We appreciate having you, and um, 
We'll be back with more on our own sports right after this. This is Tommy Smith, and you're listening to R and R on Sports. I go to work like a doctor when I rock the mic. You got to like the way I operate. I make miracles happen just from rapping. I'm so lyrically potent, and I'm floating and exploding on the scene. Me, I got the potential. And we're back with R and R on Sports, and today, folks, we got a treat for you. I, I mean, you don't even know. I'm talking about sweet tooth kind of treat that 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 <laughs> truly is going to rock your world. So sit back, relax, and listen to the the greatest, one of the greatest of all time, sports sociologist, Dr. Harry Edwards. What's up, Doc? How you doing, sir? I'm doing better than I deserve, believe it or not. Oh, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Well, you know, we got JC here in studio, and we got our other compadre, uh, Howard Robertson, on the road. What's up, Howard? Welcome back, Doc. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, listen, we're going to jump right in. For you guys that don't know, Dr. Edwards is a sports sociologist. I mean, you, I'm talking about going all the way back with the black fist in the, in the air with Tom, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos to working with the San Francisco 49ers as well as the Golden State Warriors. We're going to get to the Golden State Warriors and the recent NBA championship uh, on the, after the break. But starting off, Dr. Edwards, you were close personal friends with Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. What was it like in Louisville, Kentucky, when uh, uh, actually laying the rest to rest the greatest of all times? Well, I've never really been through anything quite like it, and I've attended uh, some very notable uh, memorial services, but I've never seen anything quite like this. I mean, to see... Uh, uh, 30,000 people, 30 to 40,000 people lining the route from um, the undertaker parlor to the cemetery as they put him away and then to go into a memorial service where there's another 25 to 30,000 people. Uh, and I mean everybody from uh, Native Americans to uh, Buddhists uh, uh, to uh, Catholics to Jews to, of course, uh, people of the Islamic faith, Christians, everybody there. Um, somebody asked me, uh, there was a German reporter there who was covering it, and he uh, asked me, uh, what did I think, what, what, what do I take away from this? And what I took away from it was um, that I hope that our presidential candidates are looking at this so they'll get some sense of what real leadership looks like. Uh, when you can bring that many people together at a time that is as divisive as we are experiencing now in this Hold on, time, hold on for a quick second, Doc. Leadership. Doc, for a quick second. Howard, I need you to mute it, man. People got to hear People got to hear what Doc is bringing, and we're getting too much road noise from you. Uh, All right. Uh, so I'm sorry, Doc. Go ahead and finish what you were saying. No, I was simply saying that uh, I hope that our leaders were watching uh, the memorial service for Ali because they get a real sense of what uh, leadership uh, looked like. Um, the uh, numbers of people that were there, the uh, breadth, the scope of uh, people who were there across all religions, races, uh, creeds, uh, uh, genders, and so forth. I mean, it really spoke uh, to uh, his message, not just to his generation, but to the generations. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I'm telling you, being from Louisville, Kentucky, there was no prouder moment than seeing how Louisville treated the greatest of all times. You actually stated that the greatest of all times is not an adequate description for no. what Muhammad Ali means to us as a as as human beings. I'd like it's, you. It's not an adequate. It's not an adequate uh, uh, description to to really capture and encapsulate uh, his contribution. Uh, I mean, you you've got to ask the greatest uh, compared to what? Compared to who? There's nobody else of his generation or any generation before him, uh, and since that has made the kinds of contributions he made. I mean, this was an individual who, um, uh, by himself, literally by himself. Uh, made uh, uh, us really begin to think about uh, religious freedom as something other than a historical and cultural cliché. Uh, we had to really consider uh, our uh, dispositions and attitudes toward war and peace. I mean, not just the uh, brother on the block that was uh, subject to the draft or the naive college student who was escaping the draft by being in college, but people such as Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy had to reconsider 
their their uh, 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 perspectives on war and peace as a consequence of a heavyweight champion of the world saying, you know what, uh, I have no reason to go over. They haven't given me a reason to go over there and kill anybody. Uh, we, we have to understand that his influence, his impact ran so deep that had he not put up the struggle uh, for the legitimacy of his name, Muhammad Ali, and insisted that people call him Muhammad Ali and got it to the point that they not only accepted that but embraced it, there's absolutely no way that millions of people show up to vote at the polls for somebody with a funny-sounding name by his own admission, like Barack Hussein Obama, oh, wow. for president, not once, but twice. He can, he can give, that one goes directly to Muhammad Ali. So, uh, uh, along with showing us that there's some things that have no price, there's no price tag on human dignity, on uh, human on principles, there's no price tag uh, on self-respect, um, Along with all of those things, uh, he had these, this, this broad swath of impact, and there's nobody else, not even a Paul Robeson, had that kind of an impact. So when you say the greatest, the greatest compared to what? That doesn't even begin to encapsulate uh, what he uh, did. In point of fact, what he did in the boxing ring might in the long term turn out to be the least memorable of his accomplishments and achievements and contributions. Wow. And this is R and R on sports, and we are having mic drop moments with the fabulous Dr. Harry Edwards. Dr. Edwards, with with Muhammad Ali being so much more than boxing, now that he is gone, how how does his legacy stay in place and not get lost amidst what he did in the boxing ring? Well, I think that we have to first uh, continue to uh, document and trumpet. Uh, the scope of his contributions, because in American society there's this tremendous tendency uh, to reduce uh, particularly uh, African-American uh, heroes and heroines down to a T-shirt cliché. So we uh, think about uh, Dr. King, and uh, all you really hear about is, I have a dream. You think about uh, uh, Malcolm X, and all you hear about is, uh, by any means necessary. And they're already trying to reduce Muhammad Ali to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. We have to continue to document and discuss uh, his broader contributions. The other thing that we have to realize is that uh, today we can see farther, stand taller, and reach higher, principally because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And there was nobody bigger uh, than Muhammad Ali. And to begin to understand the impact in sports, uh, we have to understand that without Muhammad Ali and the movement of the 60s for the for dignity and respect as opposed to simply access that Jackie Robinson and Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens and that generation fought for. That movement for dignity and respect is precisely why you have people like Michael Jordan, you have people like Magic Johnson, you have people like LeBron James who can today, who can today make uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, we have to also continue to let them know that there's an obligation that comes with that. It's not just making the money, it's serving, it's contributing, it's helping to uh, lift uh, as you climb uh, in terms of that aspect of your obligation and responsibility as you stand on the shoulders of the Muhammad Ali's and the Bill Russell's and the Jim Brown's and the Smith's and Carlos and Kurt Flood's uh, and Arthur Ashes and so forth. So given now that there is a generation to two generation gap, are today's black athletes doing enough to carry the torch forward and to honor Ali's legacy in terms of being outspoken and, and making their their feelings and their beliefs known? Well, don't don't well, don't limit it. Don't limit it to black athletes, athletes, period. Sure. It, 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 it's really too early to tell. Uh, I mean, you, you one looks back on the um era of uh, Jack Johnson and Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens, and, and, and we see a particular historical perspective. We look back on Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby and Kenny Washington. Uh, we look back on Earl Lloyd in basketball, and we see a particular historical relevance. We are now looking back at the 1960s and that generation of athletes, and we see a particular historical relevance. Some things, uh, such as history, uh, it, it's kind of like a mountain. You really don't see the full contours and configuration until you're some distance away from it. And that's where we are with regard to uh, this generation of athletes. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that no generation of athletes does things exactly and precisely the way the previous generation did. Uh, 
being able to stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before enables you to reach higher and in a different direction than you would have than they were able to reach. So uh, this generation is still uh, contouring and configuring its contribution. But as I look at somebody like LeBron James and see the kinds of things that he's trying to do, uh, even as he strives to achieve power, uh, this generation doesn't want to uh, simply uh, have endorsements. They want to own the products that they endorse. Uh, Magic Johnson didn't want to be in movies like uh, O.J. or Jim Brown. He wanted to produce the movies, own the movie theaters that showed the movies, and and, uh, be part of the distribution. He didn't want to just be on a basketball team. He wanted to own a basketball team and a baseball team. So this struggle for power uh, carries a different trajectory than the 1960s, so we can't look back and expect them to do things the way that we did them in the 1960s any more than Smith and Carlos were Jesse Owens or Muhammad Ali was Joe Lewis or Bill Russell was Earl Lloyd or the Harlem Globetrotters or Jim Brown was Kenny Washington. Every generation finds its own trajectory and direction, but they all still manage to make a contribution. And that uh, scenario is still being written by the current generation. This is Iron Iron Sports, and we are talking with the great Dr. Harry Edwards. But we'll be right back after this. Make sure you come back because we got more to set your set your ears on fire. I go to work. I go to work. I go to work. Like an architect, I build the rhymes sometimes it climbs so it wrecks. Skyscrapers look like Rolling down the street with my radio on, listen to Funky Politics. The mayor of the city of Memphis, Mayor Jim Strickland. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Laid back with my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Dr. Sharon Griffith. Hey, Doc. How are you? Good afternoon. What you say, Grandpa? <laughs> Did he call me Grandpa? We keep it real, we keep it right, and we keep it funky. Funky Politics. Part of the Katsukia Network. I'll play the blues for you. Blues in the Basement with Stephanie and T. Shaw. Some great festivals going on around the tri-state area. Got your dancing shoes? Man, as long as I'm with you, baby, I, I'm <laughs> always me on my toes. Drop that zero. Bring your blues, boo. <laughs> I got them. <laughs> we'll see you. Thank you. Blues in the Basement. The thrill is gone. Blues in the Basement, part of the Kentuckian Network. The thrill is gone away. Sure you're white. I'm not so sure. I can't verify. I seem to be reflecting the light. You seem to be absorbing it. And together we have Jungle Fever on the Blue Ball Sports Show. Powered by the Kazuki Network. R&R on sports with I Conversation. Elliot Perry, otherwise known as Socks. Man, thank you. How you guys doing? Some of the biggest names in sports. Mr. Earl the Pearl Monroe. Welcome to R&R on sports. Hey, thank you. Nice to be with you guys. Glad to have Mr. Allen Houston. Trying to stay warm up here in New York. I hear you. And the names that follow sports 24-7. Personality extraordinaire, Mr. Scoop Jackson. I appreciate the encore. The legends of the game. Mr. Michael Ray Richardson. What's up? Man, glad to be here, brother. A three-time NBA All-Star, the one, the only, Detlef Shrimp. Detlef, welcome to R&R on Sports. Hey, Howard and Larry, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. Access R&R on Sports Eye Conversation every week on R&R on Sports.com, SportsByline.com, Podcast, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Hello, I'm Uncle Howard. Jennifer Conroy. I'm Larry, the fantastic Robinson. Your host for R&R on Sports every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central on the SportsByline.com network. Get after us. We look forward to having you. R&R on Sports, part of the Kazookian Network. This brings us to the end of yet another great segment of R&R on Sayonara. Sports. And that y'all know what I go through. Before we go, I want to give big ups and big props. A basketball coach that you guys might have heard of, last name of Popovich. What about old Popovich? Pop had plenty to say about For a the change? things that oh yes oh yes what what Jennifer say what you said oh, before been asking him the wrong question <laughs> ah, we been didn't know waiting. what to ask him we didn't we've been asking him stuff about basketball he wanted to talk about life we didn't he know has, we should invite him to the barbecue he has some tremendous 
insight and things to say about what's happening in our world, uh, particularly what's happening in our country today uh, relative to uh, race relations. And uh, you ought to check Give it out and listen to it. What, what did he say? Huh? What did, what he did said he say? that, it's the ele- that race is the elephant in the room and it's disgraceful. Right. And that he doesn't have a, an answer, a 30-second answer for these issues. Let's get to talking at the table. And he said he never had to have a conversation with his children about what to do when you encounter the police. But all, every one of his black friends have had to have that conversation and continue to have that conversation. He's saying basically they don't know. Uh, being a white person and, and a white male, he has no idea what it's like to uh, go through life in the skin that we're in. Steve Kerr, sure. Steve Kerr made some similar comments, and he basically yeah. said that it was just disgusting. He said it's disgusting that that we're treating uh, the people that are protesting in this manner. If you don't even want to hear what they have to say, mm-hmm. it's, it's absolutely disgusting. And then uh, one more quick point yep. is LeBron James uh, and his comments in regards to his son. Yeah, um, I thought yeah. that was pretty impactful. And we're going to shout out Dirk Nowitzki too, who is a German, saying, "I'm going to kneel with my brothers." Well, that's you know, I, I think that's a big deal. And uh, you know, before we get out of here, I want to make sure that we tell everybody again: make sure you subscribe to the podcast, rate the show, and share. We it. need your feedback, and absolutely share it. So please subscribe, rate, and share R and R. Uh, with those people, especially those sports lovers. With that, we're going to wish you a wonderful week. Stay well, stay safe, and uh, y'all be back here next week, same place, same time. R&R is out. R&R on Sports is recorded live at LPI Studios in the heart of Memphis, Tennessee. Web designer Daniel Coates, executive producer Larry Robinson, written by Howard Robertson, and produced by Reggie Fine. R&R on Sports, part of the Kutsukian Network.